Rick Santorum may be getting all the focus in the mainstream media, but it's Ron Paul who is drawing the crowds. Let's take a look at a debate sought from earlier today that demonstrates why Ron Paul is attracting so much support. Entitlements are not rights. Rights mean you have a right. Entitled, uh, rights mean you have a right to your life and you have a right to your liberty and you should have a right to keep the fruits of your labor. And this is quite a bit different, but earlier on uh, there was a little discussion here about gay rights. I, in a way, don't like to use those terms, gay rights, uh, women's rights, uh, minority rights, uh, mon religious rights. There's only one type of right. It's your right to your liberty. The right to your liberty. Senator Rand Paul, welcome to New Hampshire. Thank you. Thank you. Tomorrow I'm going to try to catch up with the congressman. He's been drawing so many people that you can't even get inside some of these halls. What is it about his message that is attracting people by the thousands? Well, I think it's the fact that he's a consistent fiscal conservative, but he also believes in a little bit different foreign policy, one restrained by the Constitution, where we only go to war if Congress votes on a declaration of war, and there's, there's some restraint. That, a war is not always the answer. We might have to go to war, but we only go to war when our, the people's house, when Congress votes on it. One person doesn't get to make that decision. That attracts young people. He has more contributions from active duty soldiers than all the other candidates combined. And I think that's really perplexing to some people that they don't quite understand it. But people in the military are not monolithically wanting to go again and again and again. They will serve their country, but they also want there to be some rules and some understanding that it's not always the answer to go to war. His economic message. I want to separate the economic from the foreign policy. Your reaction to the economic message. Go ahead. What would your father do initially if he were, were elected president? What would be one of his first actions? You know, he said he will balance the budget within three years. He's the only one saying that, and he would cut a trillion dollars in spending. He would eliminate five departments. I think you can bank on that. He's voted against almost every appropriations bill in the last 20 years in Congress. How is he going to get Congress to work with him to be able to yeah. do that? He can't be a dictator. Yeah. No, I think, and I think he would completely agree with you. But I would say that the ultimate compromise that we're all going to make, and this is something we as Republicans will have to accept, is the spending is going to have to be cut across the board. He would go to liberals and he would say, I know you want to cut military spending, and we can cut some without impairing our national defense. Military spending has doubled in the last 10 years. There are many conservatives, myself, Tom Coburn, Jim DeMint, who have admitted we will have to cut some military spending. And he would go to the conservatives who have always been for cutting domestic spending. The compromise has to be conservatives and liberals coming together. And I think he has shown that he can work with people on both sides. Do you agree with this? No. 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 So some yes. of you don't. No. Joanne. As a voter, I would like to know what are the five things that he would eliminate. As far as the departments, he's yes. talked about the Department of Education, the Department of Commerce, the Department of Energy, Department of the Interior, and uh, Housing and Urban Development. Now, there would be a few things within those departments that he would slide into other departments, but the vast majority would end. But this also separates him. We just heard a candidate who says they, they are the Reagan conservative. Well, Reagan believed in eliminating the Department of Education. There's only one person who's standing up there and still is in favor of that. Ron Paul was one of only four congressmen to support Reagan over Gerald Ford. He's been doing it his whole career. So many want to be Reagan conservatives, but they're for Medicare Part D, the largest entitlement program of the last 20 years. So let me, let me ask you, you don't agree with this. Don't you want these cuts? I agree. Yeah. Yes. I agree, absolutely. Yes. I, we need to wake up and realize that we need to cut spending. There is nothing left for Social Security. I'm giving my paycheck away to, to a program that has failed. We need to get serious about these cuts. In the back. Yeah, I agree as well. I definitely think that we could definitely cut things from every, there's, everything can be cut. There's always, we're always spending too many, too much, and like the government's way too big right now. Randy. Yeah, n nobody disagrees with his economic policy for the most part. It's everything else. Rich uh, we'll get to that in one second. So Ken. far, all we've seen are uh, the Defense Department cuts, though. I mean, when are we going to get to entitlements? Reaction? Well, absolutely, we have to cut entitlements. Entitlements are 60% of the budget. In fact, if you take spending, 
all of the all of the revenue that comes in goes towards entitlement and interest. Forty percent of every dollar is borrowed. We're borrowing forty thousand dollars a second. So entitlements have to be addressed. Military has to be addressed. Domestic spending, but everything has to. You can't have something off the table. Senator, watch this though. How many of you agree with this foreign and defense policy? Raise your hands. Look at all how right, few we've hands got some work to do. We've got some work to do. Give it your best shot. Here, here's what I would say is that I think he's been misrepresented as far as foreign policy goes. The number one priority that Ron Paul believes in is national defense. He doesn't think the federal government should be doing most of the things they're doing, but he does think that they should be providing for our national defense. But once you say that, then we have to decide what is in our national defense. And so you have to decide where the money's going to be spent. Back row. If it comes across as misrepresented, that how can you change it? Because it comes across as isolationist, and it sounds so very 1800s. Right. Well, I'll give you an example on Iran. Iran's been a big issue, and people say, oh, well, he doesn't care if they get a nuclear weapon. Well, that misrepresents his position. He does care. He doesn't want them to have a nuclear weapon. But then the question is, can we contain Iran, or must we go to war? And I'll give you an example of how mainstream his position is. The three previous heads of the U.S. Central Command, General Zini, Abizade, and Admiral Fallon, all say a preemptive attack could have repercussions that would actually hurt us and hurt Israel. The head of Israel's Mossad, Tamir Pardo, said this week, we need to quit saying it's an existential threat to Israel because we're trapping Israel into a, a cataclysmic war. There might be other answers. The Cuban Missile Crisis, did we invade Russia? No, we blockaded Cuba, but eventually we negotiated and we took missiles out of Turkey and out of Italy in order for Russia to take missiles out of Cuba. Sometimes there could be a diplomatic solution. It doesn't always have to be war. Did he get you? No. Yeah. Yes. Well, All right, let me keep trying. No, 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 five, more minutes. five more minutes and I can get a few more. And, and you're going to get five more minutes because when we come back, we're going to show the best out of the 2010 campaign, and we're all going to wish Senator Paul a happy birthday. Thank you. And then we've got some great ads to show you, the woman who would be First Lady of the United States of America, when we come back. Stay tuned. Even though we're here in New Hampshire focused on the election that's going to be held in the next 48 hours, there was still an incredible political ad, one that was the best of 2010, and it involves our next guest. Let's take a look. How do we defeat the Washington machine? First, send career politicians home by enacting term limits. Next, require Congress to read the bills they vote on. Then stop wasteful spending by requiring a balanced budget by law. Stop lobbyists from taking our tax dollars and then using that money to lobby for more. Most importantly, expand our liberty by downsizing big government. I'm Rand Paul, and I approve this message because government is the servant, not the master. Okay, how many of you agree with that ad? Raise your hands. It's unanimous. <laughs> so here's my question, Senator. Did you beat Washington in the last year, or did Washington beat you? We've started. The first thing we did when I got there was we ended earmarks. That was the first vote I took. It was even before I was sworn in. And it's changed the culture in Washington. Now, every time the Democrats want to spend new money, we insist that it come from somewhere in the budget. Now, the Democrats are still insisting that it come from new taxes or from borrowing. But we're insisting that it come from somewhere. So the, the, the dynamic of the conversation has changed. But I'll tell you where we're still failing. Republicans are united for a balanced budget amendment, and yet when it comes to $300 million to subsidize local airports or $200 million for Amtrak, we're losing half the Republicans still. So we still have more work to do, and when I ran, I said, we need, it's just not about getting a Republican, it's about what kind of Republican you get, and we have to have ones who will cut spending. So explain to me, what is it about Washington that you hate so much? Describe it to me. They don't do what they say. Dave. Lack of job creation. That's it. I, I don't. So you see. think Washington mm -hmm. should be creating jobs? I think that they should no. be. No. They should no. be cutting They're not spending, voting to make cutting cuts. spending, and, and making tax cuts to open up opportunities for new jobs. They right. speak out of both sides of their mouth. Exactly. Okay. Yes. One more time. What? They speak out of both sides of their mouth. Explain that. Okay. Uh, basically, what you want to hear is what I'm going to tell you, and what he wants to hear, I'm going to tell him. Yep. Now it's up to you to decipher it. Alice. Yeah. Their, their priority really is not looking out for us, but who's going to help them and support them with their finances in winning the next election. Is that your priority? Well, I think that's one reason why we have to have term limits. I've been up there for Do about... Agree? I've been there 
for about a year, and I can promise you there's no monopoly on knowledge in Washington. They're normal human beings and sometimes better and sometimes worse than the average, but we need turnover. Part of the problem is in 2010, we got a bunch of new people, but none of them are in leadership. They're all new there, and we're unable to control the process. Are we're you, stopping some bad things, but we don't have the numbers yet to do good things. Are you attacking your leadership? No, I would never think of that. You know, can, I retract, can I retract that? Yes, but it still ends up there. So send a message to Washington. What message do you want to send? Well, I, I, I want uh, to send a message that they're supposed to be working on our behalf, not in theirs, uh, not to get themselves reelected. Uh, Barry, what message do you send? You know, we've been looking at some of the cuts in spending, but we look at what Leanna Panetta did last week with Obama, one trillion in the military. There could have been a lot of other areas we could have cut. And I was just wondering what your father's opinion might have been on that as well. Well, I think we need to cut across the board. And the interesting thing is, you remember we had that debt commission, and they talked about cutting $1.2 trillion. And you say, well, gosh, that sounds like a good thing. They're going to cut a lot of money. It was all from the rate of increase. The debt's going up $9 trillion over 10 years. So if they meet their targets, the debt still goes up $7.5, $8 trillion. There are people who want real cuts. I'm supporting a plan called the Penny Plan. Cut 1% a year from the budget. It's only $38 billion. You say, well, how could that work? Because it's $38 billion against a baseline of zero. They count it against a baseline that's going up 7% a year. So a $38 billion real cut, they'll tell you, is a $500 billion cut. And they'll tell you, if you froze spending for 10 years, they'll call that a $9 trillion cut. And I said, where I come from, that's just freezing spending. That's not a $9 trillion cut. i got to ask you a question. Where do you and your dad disagree? Oh, I can't do that today. I'm here to help my dad today. <laughs> You know, that's fair. I think, now, where I, do you and your dad... <laughs> we can ask the same question. Yeah. I think that sometimes it's in presentation, but I think in overall message, it's sort of like my wife and I. We don't agree with every issue, but we agree in, in, in large terms. I like the idea of constitutional government. I'm a big believer in the original intent of the Constitution and what the founders wrote about it and the Federalist Papers and James Madison and Jefferson and the whole works. But on every exact issue and every exact position not the same and sometimes it might be a difference of degree for example i think we do need less troops overseas can it be zero tomorrow maybe not but i do think that japan needs to pay more for their defense i think china needs to pay more most of the oil going through the straits of Hormuz is china's we send china foreign aid for goodness sakes that is the most ridiculous thing in the world now you're not the only paul who's got good advertising i'd like to show our viewers at home one of the most effective ron paul ads let's take a look this election is about trust. There's been one true consistent candidate, and that's Dr. Ron Paul. Ron Paul has been so consistent from the very beginning. He seems like a more honest candidate. He tells the truth about what he believes, whether you like it or not. He's never once voted for a tax increase, never once voted for an unbalanced budget. Ron Paul's plan is bold, cuts five departments. It's what we need. When he says he's going to cut a trillion dollars in the first year, I believe it. If you don't like how things are going and you're tired of politicians, he's so Something different. Ron Paul. Ron Paul. Ron Paul. Ron Paul. Is the one we've been looking for. Such a great ad. Your ads are positive. That ad is positive. I know from the work that I've done at Fox that I have been pilloried <laughs> by people on the Ron Paul websites. They're sometimes mad at me, too. It does. And you? Know, yeah, like occasionally. Yeah, just being the sun doesn't always guarantee, uh, <laughs> guarantee the love. But you know what? Now that I got such a great introduction, I'm thinking, my favorite Fox announcer might now be Frank Luntz. I mean, okay. Sean Hannity, I used to like, I used to like Sean Hannity, and I'm thinking, you know. Well, I hope the website sees that. <laughs> so here's my question: How many of you in this room agree with Ron Paul's domestic policy? Raise your hands. Almost all of you. How many of you agree with his foreign policy? So what do you do? We've got some work to be cut out, but I think the, the main thing that I would like to impress, and I probably won't convince people today, but that foreign policy is not always an either-or situation. I brought up the Cuban Missile Crisis, and we talked about that. It's complicated, and we shouldn't always say the response has to be either war or bombing, and there might be an in-between response, and that one person doesn't decide this. The president does not unilaterally decide this. The Constitution and our founding fathers wanted to divide that power, the power to declare war. The last time we did it, World War II. We were unified as a nation. We fought that war when we came home. That's more of my father's conception of the way we should fight war. Senator, thank you very much. Thank you.